I'm Kevin Elmy. In this presentation, we're going to be covering soil health and the use of cover cropping, and we're going to be looking at the organic perspective with it. We farm in East Central Saskatchewan. We've been using soil health principles for 21 years on our farm, and we've been incorporating cover crops in our rotation for nine years. We have seen issues with uh, our production. I've uh, identified some of our soil issues and we have been using these, these cover crops and soil health principles to help build our soils and, and help them recover from past abuse. The definition of soil health by the FAO members. Uh, they define soil health as the capacity of the soil to function as a living system with ecosystems and land use boundaries to sustain plant and animal productivity, maintain or enhance water and air quality, and promote plant and animal health. Healthy soils maintain a diverse community of soil organisms that help control plant diseases, insects, and weed pests, form beneficial symbiotic associations with plant roots, recycle essential plant nutrients, improve soil structure with positive repercussions for soil water and nutrient holding capacity, and ultimately improve crop production. A healthy soil does not pollute the environment and does not contribute to mitigating climate change by maintaining or increasing its soil carbon content. Pretty deep type of, of definition, but it's, it's all encompassing in, in my mind. So then the question is, do you have healthy soils? Uh, do you see weeds? Do you have water infiltration issues? Do you have uh, crop nutritional deficiencies? Are you seeing any erosion? Or do you see the low crop yields? And these are all symptoms of a, a soil health issue. And that's exactly what we're seeing on our farm when we first started into this. So when we start looking at why are we having issues with soil health and you know, there's, there's a lot of different problems and, you know, it could be one, it could be a multiple of, of different issues. But one of the things that, that are really consistent on coming up with, with soil health issues is number one, excessive tillage. That's, that's one of the, the issues, uh, especially from the organic perspective. How do we get around that? Uh, the next issue that, I, that is, uh, I've noticed is a lack of a vegetative plant growing for as many days possible in the soil. We're seeing lack of plant diversity in, the, in those fields. We're seeing the lack of those animals on, on the land, and we're seeing significant losses of carbon from our soils from back when, when the, our soils were first broken. So when, you know, when we're looking at this soil health, you know, I've, I've been to a lot of meetings and I've had, uh, you know, the conventional people saying, uh, you know, looking over the fence and saying, well, you know, our, being conventional, I'm zero till, so I'm better than the organic guys who are black summer following. And then the organics are saying, well, if you know, we're in better shape because we're better than conventional people because we're not using all of these pollutants in, in our soils. Guess what? It's not necessarily true. That excessive tillage is exactly the same as excessive synthetic use. So that, you know, I, I keep telling people, stop throwing stones. I'm stuck in the middle here because I'm ostracized by the organic people because I do use a, a little bit of herbicide when I need to. And then I'm ostracized by the, the conventional farmers because I'm using a lot of organic principles in my crop production. So that when we see this nice black field this spring where we had that little bit of a breeze that, that went through, we were seeing, you know, some dust starting to, to evolve off of the field. And the really scary thing is, is that light, light fraction that's being eroded off is probably the most important part of our soils that we need to keep in our soils. So when we see something like this, the dollars that are being lost in nutrients and water holding capacity, and once again, going back to all of the issues that we see in agriculture, the solution is flying away off of our farm going to someone else's field. So when we are looking at our soils, one of the things that you'll find when we start getting deeper into this and you, and you get into testing, that most of our agricultural soils today 
conventional and organic, are dominated by bacteria. When we have bacterial dominated soils, they are addicted to inputs, whether it's synthetic or natural. The way we get around this and fix our soils is building fungi in our soils. In, in particular, the mycorrhizal fungi. Those are really, really important. Uh, one of the things that we are, are usually lacking in most of our fields. So when you see that picture and you see all that, this is from a, a handheld microscope that I have, and you can see all those fine hairs coming in. Um, that's that's, that's some, of the, some of the good fungi that are growing in my soils. So why, how do we build the, the fungi? Uh, the fungi are very sensitive to tillage, so going to reduce tillage systems is, is really quite important. And so when we start talking about re, uh, you know, reducing the tillage, it is a, a function of the intensity and duration. So if we have uh, a, a, a relatively thin soil that's only four inches deep, and you're going in and you're working at six inches deep, well, it, the whole idea is it's like a tornado going through a trailer park. We are destroying their homes. So we have to make sure when we're doing tillage that we're leaving some homes intact so that it is able to rebuild. So we have to try to reduce the amount of, of the intensity of the tillage and the duration. So that when we do tillage, we have to be able to make some repairs in there. So have, you know, uh, go and seed some some uh, a cover crop into this field, put down some uh, uh, some fish, put down some humates, put down some food so you're able to keep those those microbes in our soils alive. We need that living growing root to act as a host for this fungi to, to help you know keep them happy, give them food. We need that diversity of plants because as we increase the diversity of plants, we're going to increase the diversity of soil biology. And it's not just the fact of having, you know, um, uh, wheats and, and barley and oats. We're going to talk about functional plant groups. And those functional plant groups are really important. And if you listen to Dr. Christine Jones, she'll talk about the, the microbe quorum. And that is exactly what we're getting at. Having one or two species in is, is better than one, but when we start getting into six or eight or nine, now we're really starting to feed that soil and keeping that soil uh, building the, the, the right way. When we are looking at, okay, yeah, we want to build uh, mycorrhizae fungi in our soil, but what species, what crops do we need to look at? So this chart, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Clapperton uh, put this together. And so um, one of the things you'll see is the pendant, intermediate, and non-host. So the more the non-host that we grow in a rotation, that means the mycorrhizae fungi, they're, they're not, we're not feeding them. When we look at the intermediate, you know, they, those plants can either take it or leave it. But when you look at the range, oats and barley are on the left, wheat, Ryan triticalia on the right. So they are the least of the mycorrhizal of the cool season grasses that we grow. So the non-host basically are your canolas, your lupins, your mustards, your radish, sugar beets, turnips, things like that. Uh, not really good hosts. Then the rye, triticale and, and wheat, they're somewhat. Oats and barley do really well. And for example of that, if you seeded oats or barley on some uh, some hay breaking or you know a, a good plow down, where you have good mycorrhizae numbers, your oats and barley do really well. Whereas wheat, eh, you know, it's it's not much better than growing it on, on, on some other crop. The crops that are dependent on mycorrhizae fungi are basically your legumes, your flax, uh, sunflowers, warm season grasses. So by having these legumes in our rotation, by having these sunflowers growing in the fall to act as a host in the fall, uh, to have flax, another one, uh, you know, it's going to help build this mycorrhizae in our soils and being able to, to continue on building. And when we have this mycorrhizae, the, the really important part of it is the mycorrhizae will act as extra roots for our crops. And that will help with the drought tolerance, uh, your phosphate availability, and then when you when we start talking about intercropping or relay cover cropping, it'll actually share nutrients between these these plants we're growing. The reason why we want to have this this 
biology in our soils because when we look at a, a soil particle ideally it should have about 50 percent air in it and that air the only way we can maintain it is to have good soil structure and that soil structure comes from having this biology so if they're going to have glues they're going to have uh, the, the hyphae they're going to have the old roots they're going to have organic matter all that stuff kind of thrown together and when we have a high bacteria soil those things collapse and we'll we'll talk a little bit about that later but we want to have this nice relatively fluffy soil that's stuck together so it's that good soil aggregation when we start looking at plant ecology and the, the, the genesis and, and evolution of soils. So when we have, uh, on the left-hand side of this screen, this is from Dr. Ingham, when, we, when it says annual weeds, and a crop or land where we're growing and there's these annual weeds start showing up, that's one of the indications that we have a, a bacterial dominated soil. As we increase the fungi in the soil, then we start getting into the perennial weeds and grasses, then we start seeing the shrubs, and then the non-agricultural lands when you start getting aspens and things like that. So on this bacterial dominated soil, this is where we have high nitrates. As we start getting more fungi in our soil and more, more functional fungi, you'll see that nitrate start to disappear and you'll start seeing more of the nitrogen form being ammonium. And as ag producers, you know, we want to, you know, keep this, this ratio of the bacteria to fungi somewhere between the weeds and shrubs, ideally. And so when it says perennial weeds and grasses, well, you know, this is just the slide that they use, but that is the sweet spot for crop production in agriculture when we're dealing, whether it's conventional or organic. When we have nitrates, we're going to have weeds. If we want to get away from weeds, we have to then tie up that nitrate and get it back into a different form that those weeds aren't trying to, to use. So when we start talking about, uh, you, know, you know, when I'm on a phone call, on emails, in trade shows, in, con in conferences, when people come up and say, well, no, we have to till the soil. And I always ask why. And it's, well, to get rid of the weeds, to get rid of the crop residues and to help water infiltration because, you know, you have to work that land in the fall to fluff it up to get the water in. And we'll go through why that doesn't work. So when the weeds are growing, uh, this is a, a picture of, of my farm this year. Uh, we had a, a dry spring for establishment of my, my grasses. Uh, I have this seeded down to a perennial forage crop, but when I walk through it, you know, there was some of the, the my, my nurse crop that I have seeded, and when I opened up the canopy, there was enough of the, the grasses that are coming uh, and, and legumes, the, the perennial forage. And when I looked at it, I could have went in and said, no, it's a mess, I'm going to knock it down and start from zero. Or I can take a look at it and ecologically, this green foxtail that's growing, because this is on, on soybean residue, so uh, we had a, a dry spring, we didn't have real good uh, quick germination of this, this nurse crop and my perennials. So then the, the, uh, the green foxtail started to grow. I looked at it as, it, is that a weed or is that a, a, a early successional plant that's growing? Because if I go in, if I do not till it, then that green foxtail is going to use the, the, the nitrates that are, that are freed up from the soybean residue. They're going to grow. They're going to die. I'm not going to work that field so that that perennial grass is going to establish. It's going to tie up all that free nitrate. The green foxtail disappears and my grasses will continue on. This is how we have to look at these weeds. It, the weeds are trying to work themselves out of a job. They're trying to fix the soil. And so when we go back to that other screen of, of on the left where we have the weeds and then we get into the, the perennial weeds and grasses, that's that evolution. And so one of the measurements, if we ever do, uh, if you do a, a, a biological soil test, they'll talk about the fungal to bacteria ratio. And that fungal to bacteria ratio, when we have this, back, uh, this dominated soil by bacteria and we start seeing wild oats, that tells me that we are under a 0.3 
fungal to bacteria ratio in the soil, and that is pound per pound in the soil by weight. Once we get over 0.3 fungal to bacteria ratio, wild oats disappear, cleavers disappear. All of those early successional plants, they do not want to have a high fungal content in that soil. They do not want that. So as we go along, those weeds disappear. Uh, we may have thistles, which then, you know, that tells us we have anaerobic conditions, so we have to get in there and aerate it, but that's a, a different story. Uh, but one of the, the resources that I highly recommend for people is a book by J.L. McCammon, When Weeds Talk. And this is exactly what we need to see is, with these weeds, why are they growing? What is the trigger? We need to, you know, find out what, what is that trigger that makes them grow. These are growing because of normally high nitrates and short supply of available calcium and a, a low, low fungal content in our soil. Residue management. When we have a, uh, a big wheat crop and we have all that straw on the surface and it's not wanting to break down, you know, we have to go and till it because when we till it, it, it rots down quicker. And that's that's true to a point. Yeah, I don't believe in complete zero till. In in a lot of cases, a little bit of tillage isn't a bad thing, but the key is a little bit. When we have residue management issues, that tells me that we have a a, a residue with a very wide carbon to nitrogen ratio. That means that we have lots of carbon and a little bit of nitrogen. The other thing it tells me is there may be a lack of saprophytic fungi in your soils. That saprophytic fungi is a fungi that will rot down stuff. And so we need to, you know, once again, support that uh, saprophytic, saprophytic fungi. When we start talking about carbon to nitrogen ratio, it gets a little confusing because, you know, what what is it? When we look at this nice little chart from the USDA, it gives a you know typical type of residue. So when we start talking about wheat straw, we're dealing with about 80 to 1 carbon for every nitrogen. Oat straw is a little bit lower. It's about a 70 to 1. Uh, then we go to pea straw. So this is after harvest, we're about 29 to 1. And in the, in the soil, ideally, the carbon to nitrogen ratio for the microbes is 24 to 1. When we have something that is, you know, 70 to 1 for the oat straw, we need to have three extra units of nitrogen supplied to that oat straw to bring it down to that 24 to 1 for that microbe population to eat it. When we start dealing with uh, young alfalfa hay uh, or, you know, something like the, the, the cover crop from hairy vetch, those are, you know, in that 12 to 1. So those those residues rot down extremely quickly. Those are too rich. So what will happen is when it rots down really quickly and it's below that 24 to 1, what's going to happen is those microbes, there's too much nitrogen, so they're going to need to eat, eat more carbon. And so if we have that oat straw laying on the surface, the microbes are going to use that oat straw to, to use that to balance their, their ration. If it does, if you don't have that residue there, what's going to happen is the microbes are going to eat the carbon from the organic matter. And this is when we, if we start using too many uh, uh, tight C to N ratio crops in rotation, we'll start seeing our organic matter potentially start dropping if we don't take uh, preactive measures. Water infiltration. Uh, you know, it, it's you know, in, in quotes, common knowledge that if you go out and you do fall work, that opens up the soil so that when you get rain, the rain goes into the ground. When we start building fungi in the soil, that is, it, the soil becomes a sponge because we have that, that excellent uh, soil structure to, that holds together. When we have bacterial dominated soils and we add water to it, it falls apart. It it, uh, it it's called a slake, and that whole uh, soil aggregate just breaks down. When we have good fungal populations in it, we have lots of glomal in the soil. It we have lots of these stickers. We have good fibers in the soil. 
that soil aggregate holds together so that when it rains, the soil just percolates water naturally. The other thing is when we start seeing earthworms. Earthworms, they have their burrows in the soil, and as we build our earthworm populations, now we're getting more and more of these, these holes in our, macro holes in our, in our soils, which will transmit and, and carry this, this water very quickly. And what we need for all of this to work is less tillage. I know there's been challenges up in the northeast uh, Saskatchewan where, you know, <laughs> to, uh, to reduce tillage is really easy because it's been so wet during the seasons. And what we need to get around that is to have something growing to use that water to, uh, you know, once again, assuming that the water table isn't above the, the soil surface. Uh, I've lived that for, for five years of my farming career. But we need to have stuff growing in there to use that water to get the water table down so that we can, once again, get our, get our biology working for us. So here is an example we'll of a sleep skin, test. And we'll see what happens. So you can see the one on the right is slaking quite heavily. Uh, not a lot of fungal growth in it. Uh, very highly bacterial soil. The one on the left has been, you know, reduced tillage, reduced uh, nitrogen. Uh, we just have a, a more stable system. Quite a bit of bubbles coming out of the left one. It's a real easy way to test your soils. So you want to take a, a, a clump of soil, dry it down for a week, make sure it's good and dry, uh, have this kind of a, a, a grate, uh, a, a basket, put the soil in there, put it in the, a container of water and see how quickly it, it uh, either falls apart or how long it stays together. The one on the left, I kept it in the water for three days and after three days it was still all in one piece. Whereas the one on the right in about two minutes was uh, completely uh, fallen apart. So when we are looking at how do we get around some of this? And so cover cropping, you know, it's, it's one of the options available. There's different types of cover cropping. You know, a lot of people will say, well, I use a cover crop when I'm, I'm seeding down forages. In reality, if you want to get deep into the semantics of it, Yes, it is a type of cover crop, but that's a nurse crop. One of the di other different types that we have besides a nurse crop is a relay cover crop. We have intercropping, we have a full season cover crop, and then we have a post harvest cover crop. Different ways of, of timing of when to put this these uh, cover crops into rotation. The key is having this green plant growing. That green plant fixes our soil. It injects active carbon into our soil system, which then feeds these microbes. And as, as we learn more about this, this soil ecosystem that we are, are, are trying to manage, it is actually the microbes in the soil that build our organic matter. The straw creates a soil armor, so it protects that soil from, from being too hot, too cold, uh, wind erosion, water erosion, those sort of things. And it does feed some of the, the microbes. But up to 70% of the carbon in the straw and in the grain is lost in the air over five years, uh, depending on moisture and tillage and all the other good stuff. But the carbon above ground adds very little to building organic matter in our soils. It blew my mind when I saw the research on it. Where we build soil is microbes. We need to have more and more microbes alive and healthy in our system. And when we look at the soil, we have to think of the soil like the rumen. We ha it has to be fed active carbon and it needs some straw. So it needs active carbon and, and uh, inactive carbon. So if you were feeding cattle and you were just feeding them straw, the manure would be hard. It wouldn't, it would come out in as, as hockey pucks and that's, that's, that's all you can get out of it. 
Now, if you're grazing fresh green grass with no straw, now that rumen, once again, isn't active, or it isn't efficiently working, and that manure is going to be really running. So in the University of Wisconsin, what they've done is they actually have a cow pie rating system. And what they want to see behind the dairy cows is the manure splots to be relatively round. They want to be one to two inches thick and they want to be, you know, you can't really can't identify a lot of plant material going through it. So if you think that uh, you, you had a, a bad job, well, imagine going around and doing the research on, on cow patties. But the soil is the same way. So that if you are, are, have the animals out and they're grazing residue and their manure is too runny or too hard, that's what you're feeding your soil. So we need to go in there and we, we need to do some change. That green vegetative plant basically will play catch and release with soil nutrients in the soil. When a plant is in the vegetative stage and it's only growing, you know, 10 centimeters high, 15 centimeters high, it doesn't need a lot of nutrients. And so what it'll do is with nitrate, nitrate is passively taken up with the water into the plant. And that's the reason why we'll see lodging in, in, our, in some of our crops. One of the reasons, there's a couple others, but, but the whole idea with this green plant is it'll absorb this nitrate and then turn around and release it through the roots as, as a different form of nitrogen, whether it's ammonium, whether it's amino acids, whether it's whatever, some nitrogen containing compound that that plant is then transformed. When that plant changes it from nitrate to this other form, now that nitrogen not available to wheat. So you'll see this weed suppression. That's not the only uh, system that, that uh, or nutrient that it will uh, play catch and release with. Your phosphates, once again, will keep it and in, in, in out of the, 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 the tie-up zone with, in, in the soil. Uh, Calcium is another one that will it'll absorb and then re-release. And the really nice thing with this low-growing uh, relay cover crop is 80% of the carbon it captures through photosynthesis gets released back into the soil to feed biology. And when we start doing that, that's a, you know, a significant amount of carbon, that's building soil. This is building carbon into our soils. We're building some resilience to the system. When we are looking at doing these mixes, we need to find synergies in plant mixtures and we want to avoid competition. Legumes, you know, they'll be blended well with, with grasses. We'll talk about rates and stuff like that later. Brassicas are scavengers and they will compete with your grasses and legumes. You want to watch out for lelopathy. So that is a chemical being produced by a plant that is released into the soil that will not allow anything else to grow or not grow well. So things like fall rye, having it underneath the canopy, you have to manage how that plant is, that, that rye plant, when it's growing, how it's growing, and what it's growing with. Dandelion's another one. If you see a dandelion plant, you rarely do you see anything growing beside it. It's allelopathic, so you have to be able to control those. And then watch how and when these plants grow when you're mixing them. This is a picture of some sweet corn that I grew uh, two years ago. I seeded a full, uh, full season cover crop of lots of, of legumes, and then I seeded my corn. There was a little bit of, of volunteer canola that uh, I've never grown for eight years or so, um, so I just handpicked those. But I had this, this legume cover crop growing underneath it, fixing nitrogen, feeding this corn crop. And the other thing it did is it kept tying up the nitrate, so I had very little weeds growing in it. So these are the things we want to look for. We want to look for, for synergies. And legumes and grasses in, in nature, they grow together. I, I mentioned earlier about functional plant groups. And so, you know, I've, triangles are, are easy to visualize. So, you know, I, I, I first, when I first conceptualized this idea, I started talking about grasses, legumes, and broadleaf. And nice, simple. When we started looking at those, those broadleafs, 
there's different functional groups in there that are significantly different because the broadleaf group, by definition, if it's not a grass, it's not a legume, it's a, it's a broadleaf. So had a little more breakdown of that broadleaf group. So we have our, I broke it, break it down to brassicas, non-brassicas, and forbs. These are our functional plant groups. So these are the things that we want to look at. To add diversity into our systems, we can talk about increasing or using warm season and cool season species of each functional group. We can deal with annuals, biennials, and perennials of each group. This is what's going to add diversity to our systems. We don't need to have each one of those growing each year on our fields, but these are the things that we want to try to incorporate over a rotation. So as an example, after a sweet clover or red clover plow down, instead of working it in, what happens if we mowed it? Now we're dealing with smaller particle size, it's going to be laying on the surface, and we've had heard the the uh, complaint of all well, you know we're going to lose the nitrogen we fixed. How much nitrogen do you lose when you're actually working it in too? So, you know, to to mow it down and leave that living root in my mind is way more important. Once you've mowed it, now we you know depending on what your cedar uh, setup is set up like, now we want to go and seed in some oats, some sunflowers, some phacelia and some radishes. So we've gone from a legume, now we're going to have a catch cover crop. So this is going to catch those nutrients that uh, that clover grew, uh, grew and fixed for you. So the oats are a cool season grass, your sunflower is a warm season broadleaf, your phacelia is a forb, and your radish is a brassica. So we've added diversity to that system. That system that those species will winter kill, and that next year, because our, we've managed our carbon-nitrogen ratio, you're not going to have a lot, lot of residue left, so you can be able to go straight into that field. This is going to build the fungi in your soil. It's going to uh, minimize the amount of nitrate being released. It's going to be a win-win situation for you. Another example. So when you seed down your, your sweet clover for, as you plow down crop, what happens when you add some chicory and then a grass to it? So whether it's winter wheat, winter triticale, or perennial ryegrass with that sweet clover. Then that all over winters, year two, mow it, and then you can seed another capture crop after it. It's adding diversity to our system. The chicory is a, a biennial. It has a wonderful root system. And when we start looking at the forbs in, in these different mixes, they have a completely different root exudate um, uh, spectrum than the other species that we are traditionally using. So by adding this forb, we're seeing some really nice responses of, of what's happening to our soils and, and how quickly they're able to recover. In my presentation, I never said no tillage. Uh, tillage does have a place, but we need to find ways to reduce the amount of tillage we do. We have to understand why the weeds are growing, what triggers them. We need to protect that soil surface so that, you know, as the soil temperature starts increasing right at the soil surface, a lot of the microbes, they die because it gets too hot or too dry or whatever. But we need to protect that soil surface. We need to build that soil structure. And that soil structure comes from increasing the fungi in our soil. We need to have a living root of a plant in the vegetative stage growing for as many days as possible. And that's because, number one, 80% of that carbon that it captures through photosynthesis is, is going back into the soil to feed the soil biology. Number two, that the fungi, especially the mycorrhizae fungi, it affects the, the plant root right behind the root cap in the soil, so right behind the tip. And as that root continues to grow, that mycorrhizae fungi moves further and further into more mature root tissue. So in order for that plant to continue to have a functioning mycorrhizae, it needs to be continuously reinfected by new mycorrhizae in the soil. So having that root continue to push, it's allowing that mycorrhizae to continue to build in that soil. 
intercropping. Intercropping is a, a, an interesting opportunity in both conventional and and, uh, and and organic, and that's where you grow two or more cash crops together. Ideally, one being a legume, so that's going to be your nitrogen source. So an example of that would be oats and peas, or we had one organic producer grow oat, pea, and yellow mustard together. Once again, when you look at the triangle, now you've covered the three corners of that triangle. Make sure the crops are easily separated. So meaning that they're different seed size. So with oats and peas and, and yellow mustard, yeah, there's enough of a seed difference there. The key is when we're looking at these, we have to then figure out how many seeds per square foot do we want to have of these to make the system work for us. When we're looking at this, this intercropping, another twist on it is using a, a, an intercrop, so we're growing two cash crops, but what happens if we threw in a relay cover crop into it? So this relay cover crop means we're going to harvest our, our intercrop, and that relay cover crop means it's going to take over. It's going to continue growing until freeze up. So in this case, we can grow some oats and flax and have some subterranean clover growing. So the oats and flax you would harvest, separate it. In the field, the subterranean clover is still going to be growing, still fixing nitrogen right up until freeze up. We can go into uh, peas and mustard and have an Italian ryegrass. Once again, when we think about that triangle, we're dealing with a legume, a grass, or the mustard, it's a, a, a broadleaf, and, and a grass. So that this way we have those, those three corners of that, that triangle uh, covered off. Diversity trumps density of the relay cover crop. And once again, this is where the priorities, uh, you have to, your goals, your priorities, what do you want? So if you want more nitrogen fixation, you have to have more legumes. If you want to have, uh, uh, you know, better soil armor, okay, we're going to crank up the, the grasses a little higher so that this way we have that, that soil covered. But the, the relay cover crop, what we're looking for is having one or two plants per square foot. We're not looking at a carpet out there. We're just needing a few plants out there just to do their thing, have their roots, you know, colonize that soil. And uh, uh, once again, if, if the goal is to do some grazing, then we have to crank up the, the rates. But in reality, if we're not going to be do, doing any grazing, all we need is a couple plants per square foot. That's all we need. When we're going through this and this uh, soil health uh, journey that we're on, no two farms are going to have the same soil health plant path. Everybody's going to have uh, potentially different crops that you're using, different soil types. So if you're dealing with sand, you're dealing with peat, you're dealing with, with heavy clays, you're going to have to ha develop different strategies for those. Whether you have livestock op as an option. Uh, for myself on the farm, I, I'm not raised with animals. I don't know how to manage them day to day, but I know how to feed them. So what I'll do is I work with a livestock producer, bring his lives, his animals over, I supply the fence, I supply the feed, I supply the water, and the animals are grazing all winter for me. So it works out really good for me, works out really good for them. Uh, the, your, your equipment limitations. If you have uh, uh, a double disc press drill and you have lots of trash, okay, well, you're going to have to do some, some modifying of, of how we're going to manage this. Whereas if you have a seed hawk, if you have something that is able to go through a lot of trash, then it opens up different opportunities or disc drill. Those are all of the things that we have to work with. So it's, uh, you know, to go out and buy a brand new drill, I'm, everybody has a budget. If you're great, it's great if you can go and do it. Do you need to? No, you have to just work within the limitations of what you have. Labor constraints, budgets, and the biggest thing that I see in agriculture now is we're, we, in a lot of cases, we've lost the power of observation. That's one of the things that I've seen where, you know, we're too busy and we're missing some of these signals that we're getting from nature. The other thing is setting priorities. Your farm versus my farm, we may have different priorities. That's what's going to drive our, 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 our journey to this soil health. When you start getting out there and, and you start hearing different ideas 
and you know you're throwing the questions out there well the answers there's a lot of them they're really simple but in a lot of cases they're wrong the right answers they may be complex there may be spot at, at times when we're going through and it's the right thing to do but the timing is wrong so you know you, you get 40 inches of rain in a growing season well that didn't help anything because you know you went saturated you did the best you could so you may take a step back but you have to keep the big picture in perspective at all times so you know these are the things uh, keep learning keep reading uh it's it's a very dynamic ecosystem so if we're looking for simple answers it the what we're dealing with is too complex to have a simple answer so we need to go out and we need to try so there's my contact information if anybody has any questions or comments um you know feel free to to reach out to me and and contact me and we can we can have uh, further discussion about uh, soil health and the use of cover crops